Reactive Training Systems. Hey everybody, welcome back to the RTS podcast. I'm Mike Tushir, and uh, today I'm talking with uh, somebody who's kind of become a friend of mine over the last several years, uh, Derek Evely. Um, so a little bit of background on this one. Uh, first of all, we talk the entire time about uh, essentially what I've been calling emerging strategies. Uh, it's a training concept that I learned from Derek, who learned it from Dr. Anatoly Bonerchuk, the super famous, um, super successful Soviet hammer throw coach, uh, who's also coached other throws and, and other sports as well. And Derek has, you know, ported the system into cycling, sprinting, all kinds of track and field events. And, and uh, you know, I've ported it into powerlifting and uh, several other things from there. So we talk about it as two coaches who are familiar with the concepts. Uh, so if you're not at all familiar with what Emerging Strategies is, uh, you'll definitely want to look that up. That's been on uh, past episodes of the RTS podcast, look in like the early 2018 time frame. Um, it's also like the full description, the full uh, video is also on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you haven't, if you've got no idea what Emerging Strategies is about, I definitely recommend looking into that first. Uh, if you've kind of been familiar, familiarized with some of these concepts, then you should be good to just jump right into this conversation. So that said, let's talk a little more background about Derek. Uh, Derek was coaching uh, throws, coaching track and field in Kamloops in Canada uh, when Dr. Bondarchuk moved there, uh, to coach throws, um, Dr. Bondarchuk lived at Derek's house for a, a period of time. They worked really closely together for a couple of years and, uh, you know, Derek gained an understanding for how Dr. Bondarchuk implements his system. And, you know, he'll tell you, and, and of course, I'm fully aware, too, that Dr. Bonnerchuk has some books available about his training methodology, Transfer of Training 1 and 2, and maybe even some others. But um, the books don't really communicate the kinds of things, the kinds of processes that Derek noticed as he was uh, coaching coaching athletes side by side um, with Dr. Bonnerchuk. So what, what I learned from Derek, from listening to him in some other interviews and some other podcasts, was essentially a bottom-up training approach. Every periodization concept you've ever heard of, uh, block periodization, linear periodization, all, like any whatever word plus periodization is all a top-down planning model. And <coughs> this is really the first I ever encountered, uh, uh, aside from maybe like Bulgarian style max out every day type training. Uh, this is the first I ever encountered of a bottom up training, training style that's really flexible in nature. Um, so when I heard Derek talking about it, I began the process of porting it in the, in the powerlifting and, and I've been calling it emerging strategies ever since. I think that that's a a good description of what you're trying to do. You're trying to allow the long-term strategy to emerge from the short-term strategy. Uh, so we, man, we jump right into it here. Uh, we talk about, um, gosh, all kinds of stuff. So if you're, I, I don't even know how to, how to describe to you what it is that, that the distinct topics would be because they're all, really, really intertwined and really interconnected with a lot of the core concepts and emerging strategies and, and with the other concepts in this conversation. Anyway, look, it's a conversation. It's a, a high level conversation about emerging strategies, about training athletes, about creative problem solving, about using variability in training, about applying these ideas to all kinds of different sports in different contexts, what it means to to adapt to a training stimulus, what it means to 
uh, to understand your peak condition and, and on and on. So, man, this is, this is a really useful, I hope, useful uh, interview. And I hope you guys really enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, please let me know. Um, give me some feedback on it. I'd love to have Derek on again. Look, I'm going to have Derek on again. We're going to talk more about this stuff. The question is, do you guys like it? Do you guys enjoy it? If you do, we'll throw on the recorder and we'll record the conversation. It can be a podcast. If not, then I'll enjoy it. So anyway, here we go. Here's the interview with Derek Evely. Oh, I uh, forgot Derek's site. He mentions at the very end of this interview, uh, eveltrack.com, E-V-E-L track.com. Uh, we'll link that up as well. Uh, so if you guys are interested in, in his course where he talks about these concepts and, and uh, teaches about these concepts, uh, you can check that out. And he mentions at the end that uh, if you mention that uh, you arrived at his site through the RTS podcast, that he'll give you a 20% discount, which is pretty awesome. So anyway, now here we go. Here's the interview for real. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean... It, Interestingly enough, I was talking earlier today with uh, um, with Liz Craven, who was one of the first athletes that that I tried this system. You know, I've been calling emerging strategies, but uh, uh, you know, it comes from Bonnerchuk, You know, and I, I learned it from you. You know, so I was talking with her earlier today, and we were kind of thinking back to. To, to that first trial uh, training cycle that we did. And uh, it was just kind of funny how, you know, I, I've, I think I've told you this before, how like I, I've been thinking about this bottom up planning problem for literally years up to that point, you know, and I heard you talking about it and it was, it was like the lights, the light bulb goes off, you know, and, and, and I go, oh, that's, that's how you would do it, you know, and so I remember pitching this idea to her, like, this is what I'd like training to look like. We're going to come up with a microcycle and we're going to repeat it over and over and over as long as you're progressing, you know, and, you know, I'm pitching the whole thing, measuring time to peak and, and the whole thing. And, uh, you know, I get to the end and, and thinking like, this is a, for me, a huge paradigm shift, you know, and she's like, so we're going to do some training. And we're going to keep doing it over and over as long as it works. And then when it stops working, we're going to change it to something else. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. Sounds a lot less impressive when you put it like that, you know. She's like, yeah, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> and just went with it. But, oh, that's basically it. Are we are we rolling now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, good. We're into it. Okay. Yeah, yeah just kind of well, you whatever know, that, comes to mind, you know. You know, it's. Well, that that's it, right? That's that's essentially it. And I think, you know, I mean, I, I as you know from our conversations, the, we've had some great ones. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is an evolving, ongoing thing. Not that the system is evolving, but our understanding of it, and even to some degree, Bonderchuk's understanding of it. And the reason why it's evolving is because it's so hard to get. Uh, the information out of him not because he doesn't want to give it but be, just because it's just the, with the communication i just went through the same thing uh, a couple of weeks ago with a cyclist that i that i'm working with um you know and every time i i you know i my understanding gets tweaked a little more and and uh but essentially when you boil it down to it that is what it is it's it's allowing for adaptation to occur by controlling the amount of change that you do and which for anybody who understands adaptation in in its most general physiological sense that makes perfect sense right like how did we ever get to a point where we are changing things all the time, trying to create, trying to force adaptation. And I totally get that. And, and that's what we do in this, um, in this system. It's just, we, we take that change. We're much more cautious about that change. And that change is we use the objective feedback 
to monitor and tell us when to change. Yeah. And that's, you know, and, and I say in the course, you know, often it's like, you don't, even if you don't do Bond or Chuck as per the way we try to lay it out and, you know, really do an official Bond or Chuck, that is the one thing that I think any, everybody can get, that everybody can take away from um, studying a system is that it's, you know, you, you really got to appreciate what change does because it can be, it's, it's, you have to change, but I think we can, we change so much. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, again, you know, also when you think about the body and the systems and the, the physiology and everything that's going on, all the changes on all the various neurochemical levels and, and energy systems levels and structural levels. I mean, all these different, you know, um, and they're, you know, they're all chemical reactions that are constantly going on in the body. Why would we think that making one tiny one here is going to, you know, uh, is is going to have that much an effect. And sometimes it does, right? But there are so many of them. How do we account for all the other ones? And, and you know, it's like, I, I, I just think there's just so much going on that you want to you wanna control that change as much as possible. And when you do do bond or truck in a very strict sense, and you start looking at the uh, reactions in a graphic form, it jumps right out at you because it, they're, they're doing this. And you're like, well, how are they, do how am I getting this, this climb? If, you know, it may be this and this and this, whatever, but eventually you get to a climb. Um, how do you get that by not changing anything? Well, that's what got you there is not changing it. And then, of course, it gets more complicated because, yes, you can change things in the middle of it, but that needs to be understood and monitored and changed, you know, changed properly as well. It seems to me like a lot of it's just reducing the the noise to signal ratio, you know, that you reduce the change, the, just the random chaotic change, and you use it more surgically and that helps you to see what's causing which adaptation like the the whole notion of of like pulling uh, what i've what i've been calling block reviews but just um you know just kind of a report of of what you did and how it went for each development cycle you know you pull those reports and and you look and and can see pretty clearly all right. It, it, it's not to the point where you're saying, you know, X causes Y in no. like a strict scientific sense, but you're no. saying it's correlated and that's as good as it's going to get. If you're yeah. talking about a single, a really single data point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I would. Ne yeah. I would never. I mean, how can you say X causes Y and there's just too many variables and it's just yeah. anybody with any respect for science or the scientific method or process understands that and you know once again you have put in way better terms you, you've explained <laughs> well, way better than i have but that's that signal to noise ratio is exactly what i'm getting at there it's like you know um you have to be very careful what um what variables you control yeah uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, and it's not a perfect system. It doesn't work all the time, you know, because yeah. you also have the whole issue of transfer. You may time up the change really well, but if the exercises you're using, the content isn't, you know, isn't uh, optimal, then you're not going to get the growth. You might get the timing you need and the peak, but the peak won't be what you, what you expected or wanted be just simply because the, the program itself wasn't there. You just didn't pick the right, yeah. you know, so it's always, you know, it's always, there's a lot to it, but once you get into it um, and you start to understand it on that basic level, um, I, I think it's really effective. Yeah. You know, it strikes me as, as like one of the reasons that I have, a hard time or I would have a hard time 
going back to a more traditional planning structure is it seems to me that there's some assumptions that are built into the traditional structure that are just not true, you know, and, and to pretend that they're true just seems wrong. You know, like it's, it's like burying your head in the sand that look, the body is going to adapt in this bottom up way. Uh, you're still going to have problems of transfer. You're still going to have problems of optimizing loading, regardless of if you're using a top down planning model or a bottom up planning model. It's just that. Can you, you give have, me an example of those, uh, uh, some of those myths? Myths? Yeah. So like, um, like I'm trying to think of one. Yeah. <laughs> No, I get what you're saying. I mean, yeah, I mean, in 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 traditional training, thinking that uh, we can, you know, well, I don't know. just it just, it just is over reliant on a on an idea of control that, right. uh, like that what you, you said earlier about everything. driving progress. You're not right. driving anything. Like the the adaptation happens. On its own, the, the adaptation happens because the body is adapting. You know, if if you don't provide an, an adaptive stimulus, it doesn't matter. You know, um, and, and like especially in in lifting culture, uh, the the principle of progressive overload gets kind of twisted and misunderstood. I think, and people take it to mean that every session that I do has to be a measurable, distinct increase in the level of stimulus that I'm providing. I have to use more weight. I have to do more reps, more total volume, more, 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 more. And it's like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On the whole, over a long enough period of time, yeah. Uh, but you could just do the same thing over and over. And while it's a, a you know fairly significant adaptive stimulus in the beginning, maybe that tapers down, but you're still making progress on that for a while, you know, and if you're, if you're doing something like what I've done with my lifters is that the load will adapt. And like for a thrower, you're still throwing the hammer, uh, as, as far as you can, you know, so it's still a maximum effort, you know, you're still putting the requisite amount of effort into it. So the, the level of stimulus is still going to be there. You know, like, I don't think it's necessary to force volume down, down no. a athlete's throat, you know, and, and I, in fact, it, it's more than that. I think that's a big mistake. It's short sighted. No, totally. I, I, my volumes, well, you know, generally speaking with the athletes I coach have not changed in, um, since I started, since I got, since I developed a good sense of what let's say for a thrower, since I've developed a good sense of what the optimal volume is in a, say an athlete that is a thrower working on eight to 10 sessions a week, I have a pretty good idea what that is. Um, and it'll fluctuate for certain athletes. It'll be a bit more for some, especially women. Uh, but it depends on the woman. Um, it'll be a bit less for men typically, um, but that, you know, I, ha that takes a while to sort of sort out and figure out. And with, with, when coaches come to me and they, they want to start this in the throws, I, you know, I can give them a year's worth of, I can save them a year's worth of experimentation. Cause I know ballpark where that's going to be. And that sweet spot in load is really important because if it's too much, then it's it's too much. They they'll have to, it'll take them too long to adapt, or they won't adapt. They get sick, they get hurt. But if it's too little, then they don't adapt either because the stimulus isn't strong enough. So, but once I set that in my own head, it really hasn't changed. And you know, all I do is fuck with the the quality and the nature of the content, and. Um, you know, and this, and uh, you know, I've said this before. This and this, when I discovered that, it took me way back before I ever met Bonnerchuk. 
uh, 10 years before I met Bonnerchuk, when I first met Dan Paff sitting in his office in Texas when he worked there. And him, uh, I'll never forget the conversation. We were talking about volume and, and uh, intensity and density and all this. And I was a young coach and he said something that was profound to me. You know, he said, look, you know, when we're talking about volumes, um, when you're talking about speed power athletes, not so much endurance, but especially speed power athletes, if you're talking about volumes within a session, there's you're really constrained. Like you really don't have the wide parameters everybody thinks you do. Like you, you've got if you want to work on power, what's called power uh, in med ball throws. Well, what are you going to do? Well, you're not. You're looking at five to eight, maybe ten reps, two or three sets. That's it. Beyond that, it's it. You could do a lot. You could do ten times that if you wanted to, but it's not power at some point or it's not qual it's not worth it it's just not it's not doing anything right yeah. and so when you think of it that way um and his point when we had the conversation was that well you know rather than changing sets and reps all the time uh in trying to create adaptation just he was talking about density but i would have i would make the same argument with exercise selection right yeah so, you know, so typically, let's say if I'm going to do medicine ball throws or some kind of powerful, uh, you know, some kind of explosive SDE throw with an athlete or upper SPE, whatever you want to call it, um, that's about, you know, I'm looking at. 15 total reps, maybe two or three sets of five to six, you know, and and it and now I may monkey with. The, the actual setup of that scheme from cycle to cycle, but it's not, I'm not going to go up to 30 reps. Um, I'm not, you know, or anything like that. I'm changing the exercise. That's my concern yeah. is the, is what's the pattern. And that is what, and not only what is the pattern, but what is the pattern as it relates to everything else in the program. And, it, you know, and so, but it's interesting having, studied and worked with this Bonner truck system and then going back and thinking with a, another brilliant coach who told me basically the same thing um, 10 years before that. Right. So right. Uh, completely out of the context of Bonner truck, we had no idea about Bonner truck. So, you know, I mean, it's uh, you're right. I mean, you, you know, you, we are hamstrung, but, you know, uh, and I think honestly, I think, I, I say this and I don't mean this in a, I'm not trying to be critical or demeaning to strength and power um, professionals. But when I see these, you know, these new schemes come along and these new, these new uh, uh, recipes for, you know, and all of them may be within those parameters that we just talked about, just different setups and stuff like that. And like it all, they always become the new thing and the new, you know, everybody. Sure. Well, and I get it and they do work, but is it the scheme or is it just the change? Because what I see is every time you see an expert come along or somebody that's developed some new trend, well, a couple of years later, they're developing another trend and <laughs> They've gone yeah. on to a new trend. Why do they go on to the new? If the first one was so great, why did they go on to the new one? Well, it because it the body adapted to it and they found, oh, it doesn't work as well anymore. So they find something, the next new thing. Yeah. Well, so that begs the question, is it the actual scheme, the content, or was it just the fact that you changed it from one to another, right? So, yeah. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot uh, lately. And I wonder if there's not, uh, I'd be interested in your take on this. I wonder if there's not some quality of paying attention that is, is maybe even critical to an athlete's ability to adapt to a stimulus. So like what I mean is, is the example I tend to give for this, this is, um, uh, like say you're a power lifter and you come to the gym on Monday and every Monday is squat day 
and you squat on Monday, every Monday. And, you know, occasionally you change the, the sets and the reps, or you may even change the exercise, but every Monday is squat day. You know, if you change systems or change structures, and now you don't squat on Monday, now you squat on some other day, and Monday is deadlift day, you know, maybe that's enough where you go, hey, this is a little bit different. I need to pay attention. Or, you know, you have a coach that writes the training one way and then switches to writing it a different way. So when you're trying to read the paper, you've got to go, okay, wait a minute, what the hell am I supposed to be doing? And it it forces you to pay attention. You know, yeah, totally. That's the, well, but that to me, you, you just described the, uh, you know, uh, you just described the phase in the reactions that we talk about the three reactions where the athlete create gets into adaptation or i love your analogy about the uh the 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 factory worker yeah. right that's all to me that's all that is right it's like which is uh you know if i if i remember that right it's like you know a factory worker comes in and uh, it's a big, loud factory and they start working and, and all of a sudden, you know, this noise and they're, you know, they have a hard time with it at first. And then and, you know, it's probably they can't really focus on their work and maybe they're not super productive. And then all of a sudden they start to adapt to it and their productivity goes up. But then they get to a point where it's all blocked out and that stimulus just doesn't do anything to them anymore now if you're a factory worker that's fine because you just keep going along but if you're an athlete and and you actually have numbers that you gotta post that's the point where you gotta you gotta change and i think what you just described is is you just basically described that right so the so let's say you did you were the doing the squats on a monday on a monday on a monday and and you know and I, you do get to a point where, yeah, the, the moment you walk, you know, you've driven the same way to the gym. Yeah. yeah. You, you've gone to, you've, you're wearing, you know, you go through your routine, you get in there, you do the same warm up, you go, and your body just goes into autopilot and yeah. you do the workout. And you're really, you may think that you're putting in 100%, but you're really not. Right. And it's at that point or before that when you want to change things and that's and you might change it by switching it up you know sure. switching different days you gotta you got to it you've got to make sure that they are engaged i just went through that actually with uh uh an uh british irish kid that i've been working with uh his uh two of them actually their brothers and one was in texas uh and, uh, you know, the, the system was working really well for this guy for a while. And then, um, be, I, I have all this personal stuff going on with this relocation and, and, uh, he, uh, you know, I've kind of got away from it a bit, but we didn't time it up very well for his championships. And he got to a point where I could just tell that he was in that phase in his reaction where he was just, it was just dull to him. Right. It was, yeah. I was just getting basically the same result every day. It wasn't going anywhere. And, and, you know, we didn't have enough, we, we tried, we made a change and, and it, and it, it caused an initial jump and then it went down again and we didn't have the time to let it play itself out, but that's what happened to him. Right. It was just like, you know, the, you know, it's like the Chinese water torture analogy I use. Yeah. Right. It's just, he just started getting used to it. And mm -hmm. the next stage, if we, if we kept it going would be, it would be irritation. And the, the, the result would actually wouldn't plot, it would plateau and then start going down. So, um, you know, yeah, I totally, I totally get that. But Yeah. I, I've heard you talk before about, you know, the, I guess just the, the staleness qualities of it and that you've had athletes uh, lift on a bonner lift uh, train on a bonner truck system and then switch back to a traditional system for, you know, fairly long periods of time. Right. I've, I've um, thought about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think that, I think that kind of becomes the major challenge well, one of the major challenges for a coach 
on this type of system is you have to like aggressively seek out these ruts that you find yourself in. And, and they're, they're little subtle ruts that uh, are insidious. They're, they're things that you take for granted. Like, like I program RPE uh, for almost all the, the lifting that, that we program. That's it's, it's been my thing up to this point, you know, but it's like, well, if you've got an athlete that's been lifting RPE for a number of years, maybe that needs to change. Mm-hmm. And, and why would it, why would it matter if it results in 300 pounds being put on the bar for three reps? Why would it matter whether you get there through RPE or percentage? Well, yeah. it, from a, from a like rational materialist viewpoint, it shouldn't matter, but it does because there's an attentional, like it causes the athlete to pay attention a little bit differently. They're focused differently. Yeah, it's a um, stimulus change, right? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 whether, yeah, no, no, totally. Um, and I think that's one of those examples that I was saying earlier of of these um, schemes. And I don't, I don't mean any of this negatively. I think yeah. you know, I mean, RPE has been around long enough now and been used by enough people that I think we can say that it is, it's, it's legit, right? Sure. But anything. Yeah, they adapt to. They will adapt, no matter how good it is. They're gonna adapt to it, and so you have to, you have to have RPE, but then you got to have, say, traditional traditional loading. Uh, yeah, pick one. Say right? percentages you know, like, or or something rep maxes or, or something bar speeds or whatever the hell it is, right? I mean, sure. um, and and you got to be able to take those in and out, and and that's you know so. When you know it's like it's like the old argument, you know, uh, in strength and conditioning circles about exercises being bad, Mm -hmm. right? Well, that's a bad don't do that's a bad exercise. That's a well, there, I mean, unless you're doing something stupid, there is no bad exercise, right? There, I mean, unless you're doing something that's that's mechanically, um. insane and is going to get somebody hurt or they're, <laughs> right. you know, outside from that if you're competent yeah. there really is no bad exercise it's just what's appropriate yeah. right and and what you know and again and they will adapt to that as well so you so whenever i hear my point is is that whenever i hear somebody say well well that system is you know i don't like using that system or i it's like to me i don't put a value on any of them in terms of ranking what to me, I look at them all as they're all legit and they're all not legit. They're all legit when they, when they stimulate adaptation and they're all not legit when they don't. Right. And your job is to figure out which is, which bring them in and out and figure out the sequencing and they, you know, and to me, all of that, the sequencing and, and, you know, the order and, you know, we need to think about it and we need to, you know, really, I, mean, I agonize over those things, but really in a lot of cases, it's really about timing the change, you know, unless as long as you respect the basic sport, uh, sport physiological principles, as long as you, re- you know, respect the principle of specialization and of individualization. And as long as, you know, you have those in your head back there helping you guide to make these decisions, the exact choice of what you do in sequencing is important, but I think we, it's overrated. I, yeah. think, I think we, relative to the actual change itself, and that's another one of those those Bonnerchuk things that came jumped out at me. Like when you do this system after a while, as you've done, you these things become very clear to you, right? And you you know it's it's. Uh, there, you know. I mean, there's a lot of focus, like especially when you start about talking about planning training. There's a lot of focus on you know one phase leading to the next and things like that, and and. I mean, at this point, I think, okay, neat. It, it, you know, if it if it works that way, neat. But it seems unimportant to focus on that if we can't figure out what the contents of each section should be to optimize progress. 
So why do I care about cycle A potentiating cycle B if I don't know what contents to put in those to optimize the process for that individual athlete? If I don't know, hey, you actually respond best to these exercises, and that's different from this other guy over here. You right. know? And and that's and that and yeah, and that's the whole that's that's another one of these that's the essence of the system, right? And you, and it is never, I mean, and that is always an artful judgment call based on data and that you're going back and looking at, right? But you're always trying to find the right, the right it's exercise. It's always incomplete. What's that? Say that again. Sorry, sorry I jumped, in. I jumped totally in there, my bad, but uh yeah, the, the data. So you, you said, you know, it's an artful decision based on data. And that's the thing is like the data is always incomplete. Oh, totally. You cannot have a fully data driven process in athletic that's training. Always an educated guess. Yeah, because, absolutely. Because, even, well, this is, and this goes back to what we said at the beginning, because even in the bonder check system where you're controlling the fuck out of everything, in those cycles, it does not change from the beginning to the end of the PDSF. Even in the whereas in a traditional system, you might change a hundred things. Even then, we still have so many variables that we never really know what it is. I mean, I mean, you 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 know, you got to go back and look at look at two two three years worth of uh, uh, training cycles to be able to 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 notice trends like. You know, in terms of transfer, anyways, like you know, you yeah. got honor checks books, but you know they help. But really, the generalization. They're, they're generalizations, and so you need to figure it out with each athlete. Well, you know, if you have five cycles, and in each cycle over the last three years, and in each one the athlete threw far, and in each one of them there was a bilateral half squat. Okay, good. That's that's about as good as it ever gets. Okay. Yeah. But even still, you got to look deeper than that. And what else was in the program? And what you know, it's always an educated guess. And that's 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 what messes people up with this system. We so want to have a recipe that we can say, okay, I found the exercises. I found the hammers. I found, I got it. I got it. Okay. I, I, I spent months looking at everything and coming up with all, you know, look at searching through the data. And I know for sure, this is it. And you plug it in and yeah, it works. You think and see, I was right. But then it doesn't because right. they, they, they adapt to it and you right. have to keep changing. And you talk to Bonner Chuck and he'll tell you, it's like, it's always changing. And so it, it can be frustrating on the for people that want that, but once you really understand it, to me, I really like it because it's it's it makes it kind of fun, you know, like right. it's enjoyable in terms of programming because I'm always trying to, you know, uh, come up with the right combinations of stuff yeah. that I, you know, like uh, I was coaching this kid this year, Dempsey McGuigan, and it went really really well, and he was. He's actually a really interesting case study because he's a um, thrower of, of a very small stature in the hammer, right? And uh, has spent the last few years being coached by one of the top throws coaches in the world, a guy named John Smith um, in the U.S. in Mississippi, who's coached a bunch of athletes that thrown very, very far. And Dempsey did very well under him, but you know, got he's always talked to me about working with me and he had come to the end of his NCAA career and he thought, okay, well, let's give it a shot. So we did. And he just like, you know, so he's coming from a good program. This guy, this is not a guy coming from, it's not like this guy had, um, you know, was coming from, uh, it's not like he's highly trainable. Like he's, he's no, no big holes in his game. Right. I'm is going to work. This guy comes from a very good structured program. So, but we got a, um quite a bit of growth out of him but his uh you know in working with him the uh i i've lost my tra 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 
thought I do this all the time with this when I do these things. But with him, it was, uh, um, you know, it was really, I, I got some really good numbers out of him. Um, you think it was the result of kind of the change to the stimulus? For oh, the I part? know what I was going to say. Yes, I know what I was going to say. So there was, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you know, I put him on one cycle where he was doing some relatively heavy squats. I would say on the force velocity curve, and I was I was pushing the envelope here. I'll admit it. Okay, um, he was throwing ten times a week when we did this, maybe eight to ten times a week. Um, he's we had one program, and he was doing like. Uh, sets of i think three to four anyways it was quite heavy and explode no sets of five i think but heavy like yeah. he was moving and it was in the 0.75 to 0.90 speed you know so it's a lot of weight and he was i don't know what the weight is but it was way up oh it's about 165 kilos okay? okay so um and for a small guy it's a lot of weight okay well that may not seem like a lot when you're doing, I think he was doing three to four sets, but he was doing it twice a day, five days a week. Okay. Yeah. That's not something you would do normally, right? right? That's not right. something you would like, you, that's not a program. Uh, uh, any self-respecting S and C person would, would program. They'd say you're nuts, but in the context of the entire program, it was the only big lift, right? You, his numbers just shot right up. Like the speeds just went, <laughs> After and he did it for months on really? it, yeah. And his speech just went. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I mean, it was you know like like the normal, sure, you know, yeah, yeah. But he just got faster and faster and faster, and the the weights and the hammer just went further and further and further until they didn't. <laughs> right, <laughs> like with everybody, right? It got to a point, and he had had some posted some good numbers and uh it was they were really good distances for him in training um and then uh you know i it was early on so we were still trying to figure out that magic you know the zone of numbers number of sessions it ended up being around 40 you know bonacek says it's about 50 sessions on average he was about 42 um, and we were able to repeat it and then uh uh you know repeat that number but anyways he um uh, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. And then, and then, you know, this was probably the third PDSF. And then by the time we got to number four and five, I mean, this kid was, was quite disciplined um, uh, with it and, you know, listened really well. And, and uh, by, I was freaking him out by session four because I was sending him, I've said this before, when it works well, you can do this with, with athletes especially on one program where you really have things control and i was you know i i would send him he would be near the end of a pdsf say number four and he'd give me the result and then i would send him a message back and say you know in the last three sessions you have pb'd or thrown far in session 21 26 32 38 and 41 and in every single one of them, he had, you know, and these are not the same days. Right. It's not like we, we, we were, it's not like that's because of the micro setup. The micro setup was different for everyone because he had school and there were changes and we were trying yeah. different things. Right. So um, it's quite, and he was like, Whoa, like I, I this is weird. Like, <laughs> so, you know, you start to see those trends and, and, um, yeah. And it, uh, but anyways, back to my point was this, what he was going in and the, and, uh, um, the coach was, um, Mike was, you know, I think sitting there watching this guy go in and do the, these heavy squats, relatively heavy squats twice a day, every day. And he's like, well, what the hell? Like, you know, but he just kept getting faster and faster. It was a bit of a risk, but it worked. Um, well, this is kind of distinctly not, typical bonder chuck style to squat to squat heavy right no but i think that's a i think that honestly if i was to be totally honest and it's interesting i just had this conversation an hour before we did this <laughs> with a buddy of mine uh a really good coach uh, uh 
throwing coach friend of mine who's in South Carolina. We were just chatting and, uh, and I was saying the same thing, you know, you, you know, if you look at the history of the Bonner Chuck athletes in North America, they have very good success with him early on. And then the, and then the numbers start to drop off after a while. And it's my totally my contention that that could be why yeah. I think that they, they go into the program coming usually from big, heavy strength programs. And um, that will last them. That'll hold, that'll keep, that'll maintain them for a year, maybe two but then you start to lose it. Then, yeah. then, then, then it starts to catch up to you after a while. And the only guy it didn't do that with was Dylan. Yeah. And, but that's because Dylan was so insanely, it's such a reserve of strength that it just, it, it was able to, to keep up with them. And, and I think with Dylan, especially in the, in the bench and, and some of the more specific throws, uh, I would say throws exercises, but some of the more specific SPE work he did with Dylan, they were hitting it a little more. Okay. Um, Dylan was getting a little more intensive with it. And, you know, maybe it has also has something to do with his fiber type and his wiring that he's able to generate so much force that he, he can develop, maintain, or even develop some of that maximal strength by working that range of the force velocity curve. So, sure. Um, but I know with a lot of them, I mean, you can't argue that a lot of them started to drop off because, you, you know, we no, no one knew why. And they were, you know, it was just right. unfortunate the way, you know, And but I'm sitting at, I'm removed from it and I'm looking at it going, well, I don't yeah. know. Maybe it is the strength thing. I think th I get what Dr. B is saying. I get, and I mm. buy into a lot of what I think what he says about maximal strength and the transfer, but I think it, it's too much. I think, it, I think, I think they drop off too much. They get too far away from it. And I think you need to find, do what I did with this Dempsey kid is find that sweet spot on the force velocity curve where you are high enough up to maintain um, your max strength or even develop it, but not so high up that you can't, do it within the bonner chuck system right yeah yeah um well that's a that's interesting to me on on a couple different levels because on one there's a big emphasis in the system on creative problem solving from the coach you know that that you have to see the athlete in the context that they're actually in so i mean you see this a lot or at least i hear about it a lot in uh, weightlifting, you know, that people want to talk about the Bulgarian weightlifting system or the Chinese weightlifting system or the, the Greek or whatever, you know, all of those exist in a cultural context. And you can't just port one to the other and, and just do the rote program and, and expect it to work the same way. Like it exists, you know, like if we're talking about American weightlifting, you don't need to port over the Bulgarian weightlifting system. You need to develop the American weightlifting system, you know, and maybe you use parts and pieces of that for totally. creative fuel. But you that's the other component of this that I really like is that it gives you the opportunity to see what's causing a result for this athlete. And then it gives you the authority to chase that down. You know, like I've I've had an athlete. My go to example uh, for this was uh, uh, let's see, yeah, it was last year for the the world championship. I was working with a guy, uh, and over the the course of our our time together, we noticed that his deadlift responded best to low intensity work. Like his best development cycles were when we did low intensity work, 70, 75 percent. Uh, for sets of five and then his second best results were kind of in the middle intensity zone and so we set it up uh, because the, the system kind of gives you the authority to to go after that so we set it up so his second to last development cycle was in that middle intensity zone 
And his last development cycle is in the low intensity zone. And that's completely the opposite of the way that you would set it up in a traditional powerlifting context. And he goes into the competition and just destroyed it, set a you know, world record deadlift. And wow. It was, yeah, it was it was awesome. Like he awesome. he had a like the meat of a lifetime. I was right. so couldn't have been happier for the guy. But yeah, and I can't believe that you would that you would have got anything near the same result doing it in the traditional way because we've we tested development cycles like that and whenever we got to the high intensities it just kind of fizzled you know and it just doesn't make sense that you would expect it to do anything else yeah you no, know? no 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 totally uh, and you know and, and and back to the you know the cultural uh context of, of all of these things that's I mean, we see that in athletics all the time. You know, we have uh, Eastern European. I was just talking to a gymnastics coach the other day about this, actually, too. Um, you know, the Eastern European. Um, and I, I see this with Bonnerchuk sometimes, too. And, yeah. he's a, and you know, he's a, a real scientist, a real experimenter. But I do see it sometimes in him is this, you know, there is a system. There is a, you know, uh if you don't fit into the system, it's not, you know, they, they don't want anything to do with you um, because in their culture, there's just so many numbers and there is so much motivation to be even in the system. Whereas here athletes have a lot of options. Uh, we need to be creative. Uh, you know, for me, and I, you know, say this uh, whenever anybody, brings up my coaching history or something like that, or, or, or any of my Canadian colleagues coaching history um, in terms of results. I don't have anywhere near the results. Some of my, um, in my career, some of my colleagues do that do these types of things, right? These types, you know, that have their names out there, whatever. Um, you know, but I say to them, look, you know, you coach in Canada, you, you may get one Dylan Armstrong ever in your life sure. there aren't 10 of them behind them like there are in the southern states right where you get you know and and so you need to you know that that there's a whole bunch of implications there uh you need to manage them you need to you need to do things with them you know uh without coddling them you need to be able you need to preserve it a little bit because you, you there's no you know and that and that that may have a, a negative effect down the road um but that's not Dr. B's way, right? He comes in, he he doesn't he doesn't give a shit about any of that because he's used to having 50 of them. Sure. <laughs> and whatever he wants, he gets. Well, it's not my experience. So mm -hmm. um, you know, that you know, and then I mean you can even look at it as you as I think you're implying, and you can even look at it even on a on a physiological or technical level i mean you know it, it's uh they they could just simply do things there and we'll, we'll leave drugs out of it for now but there's they could simply do things there in that context that you wouldn't normally do here and i think for the longest time we were at a disadvantage because of that but now coaching in north america especially in the United States and, and in Canada, we can have some really good coaches now, at least in our sport. Um, they, they, some of these guys are producing, it's amazing. Um, but in the States, man, I mean, their coaching has come a long way, man. They are now, they've, they've, they've caught up. And now I think at least at the highest level, the, in, in my, I'm speaking from athletics, um, and I see it in other sports too. They're they're catching up, and they or they have caught up, and they are now groundbreaking because they are being able to do what you just referred to earlier was, you know, take a little bit of here and there, and as long as they're thinking within the context of the principles, they are developing develop developing developing their own systems, and this is what I encourage in the course. It's like sure. don't just do wrote bonder chuck do bonder chuck but make it your own i mean it's so flexible people think it's it's rigid it's not it's there are rules but outside of those rules you have so much latitude you were just describing it right yeah. like you know switch the things around 
what yeah. the hell? Give it a shot. Like, just see what the hell happens, you know? So I, I am always very, you know, uh, very open when I hear coaches talking about experimentation. And I'm, I'm always interested in hearing what they are talking about. I'm working with a cyclist right now who took the Bonnerchuk course, took, took the course online, and then one thing led to another, and I started sort of advising him, and then now I'm kind of more involved helping him with his course. His name's Kyle Orser, and, you know, I mean, it's been the first year, and um, he he has sort of been in the ditch the last couple of years somewhat, and so he said he needed to change, so he started the Bonnerchuk system, and of course, in a sport like that, it's not throwing, so the PDSFs are very long, right? Um, we, uh, but when he started it, he went out to his first indoor competition and was like, blew everybody away. And then, and then went to a training camp and nothing but PBs and then started to fall down and, you know, well, there he is on his way down. Okay. Now we know what the parameters are. And I actually, I, we were talking one night and I said, fuck it, I'm, I'm driving over to Dr. B. So I drove over to Dr. B's and took out the computer. We sat on his porch for an hour talking to Kyle and going through everything. And it was another one of those aha moments where Dr. B threw another curveball at me. I was like, oh, OK. So, you know, yeah, you can change in the middle of a PDS app. It's just, you know, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I went off on a big tangent there. But the point was, is that this guy, he was at these competitions and these these other, from his feedback, some of the cycling coaches, and we have some great cycling coaches here, sprint cycling coaches, but they're, you know, they're in their paradigm, right? They're yeah. not, and, and they were like, well, what are you doing that right now for? It's too early. It's too, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, I'm PB and I'm doing, you know, really well. And, and, sure. you know, I think we're at the point now we, we will know in the next month or two, because we've just based upon our conversation with Dr. B, we've just changed his program. He was in a, he was a number three he's down at the bottom. And normally you would not change there, but because he's, he, his first PDSF was all on stationary bike and indoors he's got to get on the track so we had to change the program and i was a little bit wary about that but we went over and talked to me said yeah no that's fine no problem it's just going to mean you're going to peak a little later than you thought which actually is going to work out but anyways the point of all that is that uh you know this guy this this guy kyle is that you know he's had he's had nothing but faith in it and it's worked out well so far for him it, it remains to be seen what's going to happen later on in the summer but so far so good so yeah but yeah. yeah i mean it's that's that's been like the the variation playing around more with variability is something that we've been doing actually there's a couple things i want to kind of get your two cents on here so the variability thing is one of them um so for power just to just to give a little bit more context to this um for throws, I understand that uh, Dr. Bonderchuk pretty much used like one program, like that was kind of his go-to. So, it, you know, just to, all the time, but most of the time. Yeah. So just to just to um, kind of spell that out a little bit more for anybody listening, it would be like one workout that gets repeated. It's the same workout over and over, right? Yeah. Um, it is the Chinese water torture, torture one drop, man. And that's yeah. it. What you do in that workout is exactly the same. And I, so I've had trouble getting to that point for powerlifting just because it's three disciplines. And it would well, either make for a, a ridiculously long session or that would be the only thing that you'd have time to do. Like it, So you, we run into some kind of logistical constraints. So my default has has been, you know, to to put it in your terms, four programs, but it's four different workouts. It's spaced over, you know, roughly a week, um, usually a week. But I've had some coaches who have who've had some success stretching that into into eight distinct workouts spread over two weeks. So it takes two full weeks before you repeat the same stimulus. Wow. Um, okay. 
And so theoretically, that's going to take a long time to to reach peak. It could take you two years to get to peak. (laughs) (laughs) So, well, I mean, this kind of touches back on a thing that, you know, you and I have talked about in the past as far as like what constitutes an exposure and things like that, which I, I don't think we really ought to get too far into right now. But so like you take an athlete who's, uh, like we might see him take four exposures, four weeks to reach a peak, uh, doing that, it'll take him eight, nine exposures or, or still, still four exposures, four or five exposures usually, but it'll just take eight or nine weeks to, to get there, you know, which for a powerlifter is not, it's not the end of the world, you know? And, and so what they've noticed is that, uh, they tend to, they tend to be a, a little bit less beat up. Uh, they feel a little bit less kind of overuse uh, on pretty much the same level of workload, if that makes sense. Yeah. Go ahead. And- well, uh, I'm curious, uh, just kind of kind of what your thoughts are on that. Uh, so far, it seems like. I, I, it's all it always comes back to like well does it work if it works then cool you know and i'm i'm kind of sitting here saying well it seems like it works but uh i'm still interested to know if if you see okay, any here, here, here's something i've learned lately from dr b i coach this master's woman here it's the only athlete i'm actively coaching right now uh, she's quite phenomenal, actually. It's quite surprising. Uh, she approached me here in Kamloops. I asked me to coach her, and I thought, oh, uh, uh, no offense to Masters athletes, but I thought, oh, you know, I really don't want to get him start coaching some housewife 50, 50 years old. And I'm thinking, you know, but I want, you know, whatever. I like the coach. I like to get out there. Well, it turns out this woman is incredible. She's a phenomenal specimen, and she's been like, it's been one of the most rewarding coaching experiences I've ever, ever had. But she, she's a high jumper and she wants to do try. She's, she wants to move to heptathlon and do all these different events. Point of the story is this. I'm, I, our coaching schedule to get on the track was a little, uh, it's a long story, but basically uh, we were there in the mornings and every once in a while I see Dr. B and he would come along and he was watching me coach her and then, and you know, Dr. B, right? Like he, he's, it's, he's always thinking about this shit. So she was doing long jump. We had a session one day where we were doing, no, sorry. In, in one cycle, we did long jump on one day and high jump on another. And uh, bear with me. I'm getting some, going somewhere with this. And he saw us doing both. And at the end of the second session, he comes up to me and he's dead. dead, dead. And he's, he's writing all, he's written all the shit down on a napkin or a piece of paper or something that was lying around. And what he said to me blew me away. And this is another part of the puzzle. It's just one of these fucking pieces of the puzzle that will come to me because he hasn't written it in the book. He's never explained it to me. And, you know, it just, it's just the way it is with him. It's just some, you just got to wait for it to come to you. And but anyways, this is what he said. He said, he was coming up to me and giving me some advice um, unsolicited. He said, you realize that your long jump session and your high jump session are all counting towards the same peak condition. In other words, you count them not as one one, but as one two. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, they're, they're so if it's, so it's let's two say, exposures, not one. It's two expo- exposures, not one of each. So, in other words, let's say it took her forty sessions to reach peak condition of each program. Right? That would not be forty long and forty high jump. It would be twenty and twenty. And I'm like, what? I'm like. Why the fuck didn't you tell me this before? You know, like, like, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You just, you just, I just did a course and I said the exact opposite, right? <laughs> well, I didn't. What I didn't realize that he, so we sat down, we, you know, we, we, uh, we start talking about it and he goes, the movements are actually very similar. There's a penultimate step. The, the body doesn't recognize them necessarily as something different. 
And so you have to be careful with it. And he said in hammer throwing, it's the same thing, except it's the weight of the hammers. He said, if the weight of the hammers are within, I think, seven to 10 percent, the body is going to recognize them as the same and it's going to count towards the same. OK, if you go way wider than that. So let's say you have two programs in hammer throwing. One throws the seven K and the other throws a seven and a half K. They're going to be the, they're 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 going to count towards the same. They're it's not essentially gonna, the same thing. One seven k and one's ten k. You the the count is double. Okay, so he explains this to me, and I'm like, oh wow, that just change that changes things. So in your think about it in powerlifting, and I remember thinking about you on the drive home with this because this goes right back to what you're doing. Well. I, I think I actually asked him, I said, well, what about like, I started giving all these examples, right? And he goes, you know, and of course, this is highly, also highly individual, like everything. It does, it's not necessarily everybody's going to react this way, but it, but theoretically they, they should. So a deadlift and a squat. Yeah. It's going to count for the same. Okay. Yeah. I think. Well, maybe I, not a squat and a press because that's too different. Sure. But. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you need to watch out. I, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm just saying a powerlifting coach would need to watch out for that because that's yeah. a big deal. Like, well, it, it's it's certainly you know, like since we've talked about this, it, it's cer certainly been something that's going on in my mind. And so my thoughts on this, obviously occurring more at a distance, uh, uh, but let me know what you think of this this idea that. You know, there's no physical structure in your body that's counting exposures. There's no like exposure counter in the body that's uh, keeping track of this. You know, uh, what we're talking about is like with the exposures, it's it's a, a rule of thumb to help us gauge how long an individual is taking to adapt to a, a stimulus. So if you think about it that way, then stimulus with minimal change. Well, yeah, the yeah. The more change, the longer that's going to take. Well, if you, if you think about if you think about it as adaptation to a stimulus, then maybe it's uh, you know we think of it as number of exposures, and that's a very discrete thing. But it, it's probably more gradual than that. And the more similar a, a, a stimulus is to other stimuli, then you know, the, the more focused that ad adaptation becomes. So like if the weights within 10%, that would be, uh, you know, the, the same movement pattern, the a relatively same load, you know, but so what I did is I went back to, uh, uh, some of Franz Bosch's stuff, like his, I don't know if it's his, but that's where I came across it is list of, uh, uh, very ways to vary the training stimulus and he talks about variations to the environment variations to the task and variations to the organism and i'm thinking like huh so if if i'm doing you know a bench press with 200 pounds uh it's first in the session and then uh, later on i do a bench press with a short pause with 200 pounds and it's first in the session you know, that, I mean, come on, those are really similar. That's should I expect really expect the body to adapt as if those are completely different things, you know, mm. probably not. You know, now, if if one is, um, you know, a, a, a pin press, you know, for for two reps with a really heavy weight and another is a touch and go bench. Uh, with a lot of reps for a really lightweight, then yeah, that's pretty different. You know, um, how much, like, I think environment's going to come into play too. So um, not just the environment of like, oh, I'm in a different gym today, although that could, that could have an effect too. Uh, but, you know, the, the environment of like the system itself, you know, like, are, are you on a taller bench or a shorter bench or something like that? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, is the movement coming first or last in the session? So, I mean, 
how important is it to get that in the weeds if you're just trying to time up the peak so that you're you're peaking at the right time? I mean, I don't think you need to to start there in order to utilize the system effectively. But I think if you're really trying to dig in and, and optimize it, it makes sense to me to think about those things. Well, totally. And uh, back to the cyclist, uh, again, you know, working with this guy all year, um, you know, it's tricky the first time around because you don't have a reference point. And so he's going along here. He had three specific workouts. Two of them were highly specific. And one of them was a little more aerobic. He's a straight out sprint cyclist, right? He's one of these guys that's in the velodrome and they wait up top. And then, you know, they, you know, burst, yeah. keep a burst of speed. I mean, you know, anyways, he, um, um, so he designed these workouts. I, I had some input and then we went, we started out with it. And then he had this big peak at this indoor comp where he did really well. And then he had another one later on. And, and, but again, we don't have a, uh, benchmark. Like I don't have any reference. I don't know when he's going to peak. I, it's the first time. Right. So, so I kept saying to him, you know, going back and forth with him, well, you know, and it was right in the middle of all this. I, I w went through this with this Dr. B and and I'm like, well, you know, Kyle, I mean, we can look at the numbers a million different ways here. It, you, you know, generally speaking, yeah, it's going to take about 50 sessions, according to Dr. B. And it's pretty accurate. You're somewhere in that neighborhood, give or take. 10 each way and some athletes give or take 20, 30, but it's a ballpark, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to expect somebody to, to uh, peak in 10. And I've had athletes before where I thought it was around 15, but now thinking back now thinking, putting this into context, if I had three programs, it wasn't 15 sessions. They were all just recognized as one. So it was 45, which brings me more to the magic number, right? So I was saying to uh, Kyle, I was saying, well, you know, we don't, we just don't know. Like we have to keep going with this because, and he had a lot of faith in it. I, I, I got to admit, because there were some parts where it was really plateauing. Um, and I, and I'm like, well, if we look at these sessions as counting as one, well, then you're at 40 right now. If we look at them as separate, you're at 20. So I just don't know. And then when I went over to Dr. B's and we sat down, he took one look at them and he went, no, you're, those all have to be counted the same. And once we did that, it all started to make sense, right? He was right where we thought he should be. And um, the, the other it, real interesting thing happened there. So we're looking at this guy's graph and I'm sitting with Dr. B on his porch and Kyle's on Skype. We're trying to sort this out. What we're trying to do is figure out where he is objectively. And should we change the program because he's come down and he's missed it? Or is he a number three and he's in the ditch? And he, if we keep going, he's going to go up, right? That, that was the question. We just didn't know. We needed Dr. B's advice. So we sat down there and we, and, and at first Dr. B looks at all this and he goes, well, they all count the same. He goes, you've missed it. He goes, so, you know, uh, he's on his way down and we thought, okay, well, and that's kind of what, that was the opposite of what I was telling him before I went over there. I was saying, I think you're a three and you're just in the ditch. It's either that, because remember he's down. Okay. Like he's yeah. gone up and he's come down. So he's either, a three or he's a one and he's at, and he totally missed it. Right. It's fine. He just would have to start all over again. So we're sitting there and then Dr. B says, well, you, you know, you've missed it. And then he go. And so we, so we start talking along those lines and then Dr. B goes, ask him a question. He goes, <laughs> he goes, when you were down, how did you feel? Like, did, did you feel normal, good, or were you, like, really bagged? And Kyle was like, oh, I was really bagged. I was sore all the time. I was, oh, and then Dr. B, complete 180-degree turnaround. He goes, oh, then you're, then you're in the ditch. You're a three. You, 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 need to, you need to stay on this program. 
but he couldn't stay on the program because he was a cyclist going indoors, was training indoors on a, on a computerized hooked up station, a watt bike is what it is. Um, it's basically a, a very expensive, sophisticated stationary bike hooked up to a computer, but he needed to get on the track because that's where he is right now. Right. So I'd be like, well, what's he going to do? And Dr. B goes, well, just change it. Just change the program. Keep going up. And I'm like, that's okay. You know, he's at the ditch. And Dr. B goes, yeah, the only thing you have to understand is that you're, you don't know when the peak is going to come because you're, you've made a change. It's going to extend your peak condition a little bit, maybe a lot, maybe you don't know. And I'm like, well, we don't know when he's going to peak anyways, because we have this <laughs> first time we've ever done it. So let's just do it. So we made the change and he's Kyle is off to the races, but it was really interesting I think that hopefully if I, if I explained it right, um, it gives a bit of insight into how this, you know, I mean, you got to look at it. You got to take all these little factors into consideration and how Dr. B looked at it and thought about it. But the moment he, the moment Kyle told him that when he, when the results started going down and he felt like he was just bagged and this is, this is, uh, this was, 45 sessions into it, he um, counting these workouts as all in the same. Um, he goes, uh, you know, doc, as soon as he heard that, he goes, oh, that's definite sign that you're in the ditch. And I, I've heard that before and I've experienced before with some of the throwers, the ones that are twos and threes when they go down. They're, they're a mess when they're down. If you're down, if the results are down, when I say down, the results are down. If the results are down, but you still feel, you don't feel anything, well, you've missed the peak. Hmm. You were in great shape, and it's just, you still feel good, but you've adapted. You just feel blah. You don't, it's not like, like uh, when you're in the ditch, when you're truly in the ditch, you're, you're, you're losing sleep your body aches, you're sore, you know, that's so when you so to, when you're feeling bad like that, not not recovered like that, that you would take that as a sign to, you know, like a type three response, you just keep going. Just wait and it then, out. Just wait it out. If 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 that's if you're on if you're on a complex methodology, yeah, then you would just wait it out. It's gonna come up. It's gonna come up. But you make the adaptation. We we couldn't because this up to that point it took way longer than we thought. It's sure it's May, yeah. And the guy's got to get on the goddamn track, so we made the change. And Doctor B was totally cool with it. He said, "Oh yeah, no, it's fine. Yeah, I mean, you do what you got to do, right? So we're, yeah. I mean, we're going to complex that change. He's going to make the ch he's changing the whole program, new workouts, new lifts, new everything. But then that's going to be that's going to stay the same, right? And right. he said, "That's totally fine to do that." You just have to understand the consequences of it, which are just that your peak may come a little longer. Because every time, remember, one of the principles is every time you make a change, it extends the time to peak condition. Sure. So, yeah. So, anyway, still learning, still learning. Yeah, about man. It. Like I hate that. You know, we should. I was going to say, I know that you've got to get going here. Kid. Yeah, I got to run and get my kid from school. So. Um, All right, man. Well, man, I really appreciate your time and, and thanks again for waiting up for me. Um, yeah, definitely. I think, think there's a lot more to talk about. So, uh, yeah, let's do this again, man. Yeah, dude, you are, you are, I always get so much out of, out of our conversations. One day we will meet one of these days for sure. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah, just a, if, if I can just plug the site, evil track. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the course is up there. If anybody, I'll tell you what, anybody who refers to this, I'll give them a 20% discount. Um, awesome. um, and, uh, they just, just tell me that they, they saw the, uh, they, they saw Mike's video and yeah. anyways. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, every, anytime we, we chat, I, uh, I always get something out of it. You have a, you, you have such a good understanding of this and it, it, I really enjoy Thanks. It. Thanks. And yeah, I'm moving we'll... to Chicago. I'm moving to Chicago. So if anybody you... in Chicago, you want to do coffee sometime, give me a call. I'll be there in August. Fantastic. All right, man. Well, I'll, I'll make sure to link that stuff up. And thanks again for your time, buddy. All right, brother. You take care of yourself. See ya. So one more thing. Um, 
we recently revamped RTS Classroom. Uh, as I've developed my understanding of the training process, uh, no doubt you've heard me talk a lot at this point about emerging strategies and um, how I've implemented that and what all the ideas are that surround it. Um, I've recently revamped RTS Classroom to get into emerging strategies a lot sooner, actually right away. Uh, the lessons are all new, um, all freshly uh, recorded and everything. Um, so we get into emerging strategies right away. And this is a pipeline of classes again. So it's set up really similar to the last classroom. Uh, each class is three months long, uh, 10 lessons. Um, the main difference is that topic wise, we're going to get into emerging strategies right from the first class. And then we'll get into a deeper and deeper dive of classroom the further we go. So the first series, the first class, the first 10 lessons is um, emerging strategies framework. And we'll talk about uh, the fundamental ideas behind emerging strategies, how you set up uh, emerging strategy cycles, um, how you set up pivot blocks, how you set up maintenance, how you peak for competition, uh, and, and so on and so on. Um, it will be, that particular class will be similar to the emerging strategies class that we taught before. Um, the main difference there is that before it was an advanced class that we only offered to people who had completed a certain amount of classroom uh, work before then. So now we're offering it straight away. And we've modified the class so that we uh, include prerequisite information in that first series. Now, if you've already had the emerging strategies uh, class from before, the, the more advanced offering, uh, we'll let you skip emerging strategies framework because for the most part, you've had that information already. Um, and we'll, we can put you straight into emerging strategies tactics. Uh, this one gets more into components of programs, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of those components, strengths and weaknesses of certain exercises even, uh, and how you may break down different strategies uh, to, to utilize them and figure out what's going to work best for a particular athlete um, and what connects. So if someone responds well to one intervention, um, does that indicate to you that you should try the, the next thing in the chain? Um, and I intend to do quite a few of these. So um, we'll start, you know, for, for anybody who's coming into this fresh, we'll start you with Emerging Strategies Framework, and then you can keep this going as, as long as you want. If you'd like to continue through the more advanced classes, then uh, for sure uh, that is an option for you. Um, and I want to build this out so that uh, I take, a, I put a lot of depth into this Emerging Strategies idea. Um, I also want it to be all organized and presented in a way that makes it very useful, uh, that makes it so that uh, these are ideas that you can implement in your own training or your client's training right from the get-go. So if the emerging strategies idea is something that's inter interesting to you, um, I definitely think that this is the way for you to learn about it uh, in the context of, of powerlifting or strength sports or, uh, or barbell sports. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, uh, we'll make sure to, to provide a link uh, to RTS Classroom registration. Uh, conversely, you can go to reactivetrainingsystems.com and you can find it in the store links. Uh, we'll make sure that it's pretty easy to find. Um, so with that, I hope, uh, hope to see you in the class. Reactive Training Systems.